Um, so welcome to the Air Sea Fluxes from Space webinar series. Today, we have Nicholas Schneider from the University of Hawaii, who has kindly agreed to um, get up at the crack of dawn or before the crack of dawn to talk to this webinar series. He's going to talk about scale dependence of mesoscale air sea interaction and the Gulf Stream Convergence Zone. So I'll let you take it away, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. It is a little bit early. Yeah, so I, I hope I'm semi coherent. Um, so the topic today is the Gulf Stream Convergence Zone. This is a, a feature, a climatological feature of the surface wind divergence uh, with a name that has been coined by Larry O'Neill. And that's shown here in this slide. Uh, that's based on satellite observations from QuickScat and from MSIE, uh, sea surface temperatures. And shown in color uh, is the surface wind divergence. It's a long-term, uh, several-year average of surface wind divergence, again, based on quick step. And that shows uh, uh, this dipole of surface wind divergence in the Northwest Atlantic uh, over the Gulf Stream that is indicated by the solid contours in sea surface temperatures. So you see, can you see, by the way, can you see my cursor? Can you see cursor move around? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So you see, um, uh, obviously, the Gulf Stream here uh, with the warm part, warm parts of the Gulf Stream, and then the cold, the Gulf Stream itself, and the, 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 the cold sea surface temperatures of the coast of North America. Uh, and this separates uh, regions of positive surface wind directions on the, cold, on the cold flank of the Gulf Stream and negative surface wind directions on the warm, prim, warm flank of the Gulf Stream. This is, as I said, a climatological feature. You find a similar thing over uh, the uh, Kuroshio. You find a similar thing over the Gulas. So this is a feature of the Western uh, boundary currents, uh, the air interaction, the Western boundary currents. And I will focus today really on the response of the atmospheric boundary layer to the surface, sea surface temperatures and the winds. Okay, so this is the feature, and that's just to set the stage where we are. Uh, it becomes important. Of course, uh, this is uh, not just the region of the Gulf Stream, but it's also the regions of the... Uh -oh. What do you Of the... Of the storm track. This is a very old picture showing, uh, showing the arm, uh, the Rubin square uh, value of 200 millibar heights from ECMWF. And of course, we are up in this upper right corner in the North Atlantic. And you see, this is the area of uh, the storm track. This is here for uh, the winter months only. Uh, but so we not only have the features of the sea surface temperatures, but we have a time varying, rapidly varying uh, winds associated with the Gulf Stream uh, that themselves are associated with very large values of surface wind divergence and convergence. So this is a picture uh, from um, uh, from a model actually uh, from Coams, uh, and that shows just a snapshot uh, in January two thousand nine of the surface wind divergence uh, in in contours. Uh, and you see these very large values of a surface wind divergence here of the order of uh, 10 to the uh, 10 times 10 to the minus 5 inverse seconds associated with the uh, with, uh, uh, synoptic systems. And if you look at this order uh, associated of the of the surface wind divergence that you have associated with the highs and low pressure systems with the storms that we have, then you see this order of magnitude 10 times 10 to the minus 5 is about an order of magnitude larger than what we see in the overall average. The overall average here, the units of the color are in 10 to the minus five seconds, but the values that we see as 0.5, so an order of magnitude less. So we have to deal in this area with uh, uh, the, the storm, the sea surface temperatures, but also the storm track. Uh, and the uh, storm track itself is actually modified by the by the sea surface temperatures you can see here from the uh, from a plot by Booth et al from 2010 that shows the storm track uh, on the upper left this is a standard deviation uh, of uh, meridional winds band pass filtered between two and a half and six days uh, at 850 millibar and in b and the in the uh, on the lower left uh, you see that's a 10 meters and you see the storm tracks at the free troposphere and the surface actually look very much different 
uh, in that uh, the the features is much more aligned at the surface. The features of the storm track are aligned with the Gulf Stream front, which is indicated by this white line here. And that, of course, is mediated by the air sea temperature difference, which is shown in the upper right. And so we see that uh, this feature is affected by sea surface temperatures, by the storms and the storm track. Uh, and we have to deal with all of these issues in trying to understand the climatological uh, 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 distribution of surface wind divergence. Now, I will focus today really solely on the function on the atmospheric boundary layer response. There's a large uh, literature that looks at the uh, uh, responses at the biases, uh, um, um, uh, the skewness of the surface wind divergence that in, it's induced by the fronts. I will not talk about this today. We can talk about this in question and answer if you want to. I will focus solely on the impact of the surface sea surface temperatures and the scale dependence of these. Now, if you look at the uh, this is going into this area uh, of this uh, very large uh, uh, um, literature of uh, the atmospheric, uh, the boundary layer response to the ocean mesoscale sea surface temperatures, where the Gulf Stream front is considered an ocean mesoscale features. Uh, and uh, of course, a classic example of the atmospheric boundary layer response or the surface wind response to uh, the ocean mesoscale sea surface temperatures as shown here. This is not the Gulf Stream, this is the Gullas return flow, return current uh, in the uh, south of uh, Africa. This is South Africa up here. Uh, and in this plot from Larry O'Neill here from over 10 years ago, you see two variables that are being disp uh, displayed. In color, it's the surface wind speed, and in contour, it's the sea surface temperatures. Surface wind speeds is given uh, by, um, by the colors, as I said here, by this color bar, and the sea surface temperature is given in contours with a contour interval of about a quarter degree K. And uh, both of them have been high pass, especially high pass filtered uh, to permit uh, only uh, um, the ocean mesoscale. So I think it was uh, less than about a thousand kilometers uh, spatial scales. Actually, their filter is slightly unisotropic between uh, latitude and longitude, but it's basically the ocean mesoscale. And the point of this figure, of course, is something that you're all very familiar with that we have at the ocean mesoscale uh, very strong uh, co-variations of surface winds uh, with sea surface temperatures, where we have uh, the solid contours of warm sea surface temperatures being associated with warm if, with warm colors of the wind speed, which corresponds to increases in the wind speeds, the negative values of sea surface temperatures, the dashed ones, associated with reductions of the wind speed. Now, this, of course, is a, a, a classic uh, imprint of the ocean mesoscale on the boundary layer, and it comes from as an imprint of the ocean on the atmosphere. Uh, the sign of this response is opposite to what you expect from the large scales. Uh, if you were to think uh, that the winds uh, increase the latent heat flux uh, and therefore imprint themselves on sea surface temperatures, you would expect exactly the opposite sign of the response, that an increase in wind speeds is associated with cool sea surface temperatures, while what we see here is an increase of the wind speeds is associated with warm sea surface temperatures. So this signal clearly comes from the ocean and imprints itself on the atmosphere. Now, in terms of the dynamics, the scale dependence that I would like to talk to you about, there are two processes uh, that we invoke here. And again, this is all very classic stuff. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Uh, there are two effects, the vertical mixing effect and the pressure effect. And both of them are scale dependent. And basically what we'll do today, today you, uh, what we'll do, do today is we develop that idea of the scale dependence some more. And so just a little schematic on the vertical mixing effect. If you just uh, think of a very simple example here that you have an atmospheric boundary layer uh, separated by the sea surface temperature, this lower line and the top of the boundary layer is up line. And in this boundary layer, of course, you have a wind, wind shear. It's at the bottom Ekman layer. And this uh, wind shear that blows from ambient sea surface temperature to the warm sea surface temperatures. Then of course, as uh, the air passes uh, from cold to warm, it will imprint uh, the warm sea surface temperatures on the air temperature. However, it will take some time. It will take some time of the order of the uh, adjustment time of the atmospheric boundary layer, something like several hours to half a day. Uh, and so if the winds are swift enough, uh, uh, then we have an area where, of course, uh, the air temperature adjusts to sea surface temperature slowly, but it's not fully adjusted yet. 
Uh, and so the areas where the cooler atmospheric uh, boundary layer overlies the uh, warm sea surface temperatures, which impacts the vertical mixing and enhances the vertical mixing, and thereby brings the higher momentum from the loft to the surface, and therefore accounts for the increased wind speeds that we observe over the warm sea surface temperatures. This is a vertical mixing effect. And again, as I said, as I emphasized, uh, this is um, uh, giving this, 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 we, uh, we encounter, we all expect to this situation, we expect this situation uh, when we have strong winds that cross small sea surface temperature features, when basically the winds cross sea surface temperature features. And so if we put it into non-dimensional numbers, then we'd say uh, we expect this when the advective time scale uh, of an air parcel uh, passing uh, in the atmospheric boundary layer, when this advective time scale is smaller than the, um, than the boundary layer adjustment time. So the air simply did not does not have time to adjust, and you get this in, disequilibrium between the air temperature and the sea surface temperature. Now we are interested in the Gulf Stream convergence zone. Uh, and so uh, let's just think of the surface wind divergence. Again, this is very classic stuff. Uh, so we have an acceleration of the surface winds here. And so we would expect that we have surface wind divergence, where the winds blow from cold to warm. Basically, we have an acceleration in the direction of the winds, and we get surface wind divergence. And surface wind convergence, when winds blow, from, uh, blow towards cooler sea surface temperatures. And of course, we can see this. This is the classic uh, um, schematic from Shelton. Uh, where you see this uh, um, a schematic front between cool sea surface temperatures up above and warm below, separated by this undulating front. And we are interested in the surface wind divergence here. This is shown for stress, but it applies equally for the winds, of course. It's an argument that involves wind speed. Over the cool sea surface temperatures, we expect from these observations to have lower wind speeds over the warm, higher wind speeds. On the, so we see where the winds cross the front. Uh, that we expect an area of surface uh, wind uh, divergence, you have stress divergence or surface wind divergence. Uh, we also have an impact on curl, but we'll focus today on the surface wind divergence. And of course, that's observed. Again, this is all the classic stuff uh, where we have now scatter plots from several areas in the in the world's ocean, uh, the Southern Ocean, the Tropical Pacific, Tropical, tropical Instability Waves, Kuroshio and Gulf Stream. What is shown here is a scatter plot between a downwind sea surface temperature gradient. So the component of the sea surface temperatures that that component of the sea surface temperature that's in aligned with the large scale wind. So formally it's a surface wind divergence here uh, with a downwind sea surface temperature gradient. So the dot product between the unit vector of the winds dotted into the SST gradient. And uh, that that uh, uh, this downward SST gradient is plotted against the surface wind divergence, and you see these very nice big height correlations uh, with these slopes uh, that vary uh, from region to region. But you always have this very tight uh, uh, tight uh, relationship. So the important part here is uh, that this process uh, invokes the sea surface temperatures, but it also invokes the wind direction. So uh, I started off with we are in the storm track. So that's something we expect to be modulated by the daily varying winds in the in the Gulf Stream in the in the boundary layer associated with the storm track. So if we simply look at as is often done that these things are time averaged over monthly, weekly to monthly time scales over time scales longer than associated with the storm track, we expect that something that should be a little bit more complicated. The dynamics that we have to invoke. Uh, than simply saying we look at an average response because we have to account for the, the daily very wind directions associated with the storm track. Okay, this is a surface, uh, surface uh, uh, the vertical mixing effect. Now, pressure effect, of course, is again something very classic. It comes from the tropics. Actually, both of these processes were first developed in the tropics. The pressure effect, so same sort of uh, scenario. We have the boundary layer, sea surface temperature here, uh, top of the boundary layer here. Now we have, again, a warm blob in the middle. And now we let's just say uh, that the winds are very weak or uh, that uh, the uh, the scales associated with sea surface temperature are very large, uh, such that uh, the air has plenty of time uh, to adjust uh, to the underlying sea surface temperatures. And of course, we simply imprint in the air temperatures uh, in the warm sea surface temperatures. Uh, uh, and then we get, uh, hydrostatically speaking, we get a, a low low pressure over the warm sea surface temperatures, and this we get a hydrostatic pressure gradient. 
and uh, and a convergence over the winds right over uh, this uh, this warm sea surface temperature. Now again, this is again classical Ekman Ekman dynamics. If you look, what is the res response in this bottom Ekman layer to this warm sea surface temperatures? Then, as was shown in original uh, um, uh, papers by Ekman, uh, or then further developed by Minobe. Uh, that you would expect in this case that the divergence of the winds is associated to the Laplacian of sea surface temperatures. Now, so this is now a situation again coming back to the scale dependence where we say we have either weak winds or we have winds that go along features of sea surface temperature such that the air is completely adjusted to the sea surface temperature. So here would expect that that occurs when the advective time scale is larger. Uh, then the boundary layer adjustment time scale. So the boundary layer adjustment is is, is adjusted, right? It's, uh, so this is the scale dependence that we have here. And of course, this is uh, very relevant. Uh, coming back to the casting convergence zone, uh, Minobe-san in this paper, in this seminal paper here 15 years ago, 16 years ago now, he has shown uh, uh, that this uh, surface wind divergence here, this is of course now in convergence. So the signs have been flipped to what I showed you before. We see again this dipole uh, of surface wind divergence or convergence in color over the Gulf Stream in the Northwest Atlantic. We see that, of course, in the reanalysis and uh, this relationship that's hypothesized uh, uh, between uh, the uh, between the sea surface temperature and the surface wind divergence involves the plusion of the sea level pressure, according to Ekman dynamics. And you see that roughly, you see a co-location between the wind convergence and the plus of sea surface temperature. You might say, well, that you expect simply from also an Ekman layer geostrophy uh, that's really related to sea surface temperatures. And then you see here in the lower right, the Laplace of sea surface temperatures. So according to this uh, index that has been invoked uh, for the pressure effect, you see a rough co-location a bit of the Laplace of sea surface temperatures with the surface wind divergence with the red values of the negative Laplace of sea surface temperatures being associated with wind convergence in this plot. And uh, the blue values up here with wind convergence. Doesn't, uh, doesn't work completely uh, always. If you look at individual blobs, it doesn't line up all that well. Uh, but overall, uh, the overall feature is there. And so that has been taken as, uh, as indication uh, that uh, this, this process is active. Now, Going back now to the Gulf Stream conversion zone, let's see what we are doing here. Uh, so let's, uh, again, this is a repeat of a plot that I showed you a little bit earlier. In colors, the surface wind divergence um, and in contours, the sea surface temperatures. And I just focus on this area between 62 and uh, 52 west uh, in this area where the Gulf Stream is approximately an east west front. Makes things very simple. So we just only look at this now as a function of latitude. And look at uh, uh, simply the, the distribution of sea surface temperatures and surface wind divergence. So this is now a function of latitude in this band between 62 and 52 west all year. So seasonal cycles all put in the blender. Uh, no distribution, no, no separation between the summer and winter. Uh, and uh, you see in the color here in red is sea surface temperature. The units are 10 degree K. So this is from the warm sides of the Gulf Stream. To the cool side of the Gulf Stream, we have a difference of about 15 degrees Kelvin, the difference uh, between um, uh, across the Gulf Stream front. And associated with that is the surface wind divergence shown in this black line in units of 10 to the minus 5 inverse seconds. And you see again the order of magnitude of this dipole of about 0.5 uh, times 10 to the minus 5 inverse seconds with negative values of the surface wind divergence on the warm flank of the Gulf Stream and positive values on the on the cool flank of the Gulf Stream. Now we can start looking at these indices that have been invoked uh, many times before uh, for the for this distribution. Let's just start with Minobe's uh, a relationship between the surface wind divergence and the plus of the surface temperature. So the only uh, uh, hitch here or the only twist that we do here is that we look at this uh, distribution not for the long-term average, but we look at it for daily values. So daily quick scout values, uh, uh, daily or three-day averages of AMSIE. And we simply look now, rather than looking at the overall average, which is a black line, which is hard to see anymore, uh, we look at conditional averages of the surface wind divergence in blue, we look at the conditional averages of daily surface wind divergence when the Laplacian of sea surface temperature is positive. And in yellow, it's yellow or green, whatever this color is, 
uh, daily uh, values of the surface winter versions when the Laplace of the sea surface temperature is negative. And again, you would expect if this is really active on daily time scales, or if it, it's not just active, but it explains large amount of the variance, then you would expect the surface winter version to be separated uh, according to the sign of the Laplace of sea surface temperatures. And you see that maybe a little bit, but overall, this is uh, this by itself is not able to account uh, for the dipole of the uh, of the surface winter versions based on the daily data. So we saw it in the long-term average, so qualitatively, we see it already in the long-term average in terms of the curvature, you see in the black line, the curvature here is associated with, uh, I'm sorry, the surface winter version, negatively of the surface winter version is associated with one sign of the curvature and opposite the opposite sign of the curvature here. So in the long-term average that works, but in daily values, it does not seem to work. At least it doesn't account for the variations. Now let's look at the vertical mixing effect or this index of this uh, surface winter versions related to the downwind gradient of sea surface temperatures. Note that this is a downwind gradient of sea surface temperature, so that takes the wind direction into account. It's done every day. So every day you have a different values of the wind direction. And therefore, even if the SST field is unchanging in time, this product, this dot product between the wind, di wind direction and the gradient of sea surface temperature, that will change every day because the winds change every day. So if you do the same sort of exercise of conditional averages between surface wind divergence and now the downwind gradient of sea surface temperature, then we see a very nice separation between these two, right? So that we have values where the downwind gradient of sea surface temperature is positive. That's meaning we go from cold to warm. This is associated with positive values of the surface wind divergence. When the winds go from a warm to cold, the downwind SST gradient is negative. We have negative values of the surface wind divergence. So there's a nice separation. So that indicates that indeed, as we suspect, we are in the Gulf, we are in the storm track. And so the wind direction is important. We can't just simply average over that, or at least we have to explain how this averaging uh, uh, comes about, how this works. We have to take the daily changing of the, in the storm track, the cha daily changing winds in the storm track into account. Okay, so this is all sort of classic stuff. Now let's see what we are doing here. So the hypothesis that uh, we that will I try to develop here is that the Gulf Stream convergence zone is resulting from this hypothesis. So it is the results on the storm track for the Gulf Stream and uh, sea surface temperatures. These together give us somehow the surface wind divergence. Now the Gulf the storm track does double duty. Uh, the storm track is associated with transients, and that by itself is associated with very large values of the surface wind divergence. I showed you this plot from Larry O'Neill, just simply this snapshot of, uh, of a cyclone, a middle altitude cyclone, and that's associated with very, very large values of surface wind divergence. So that directly imprints itself on the surface wind divergence. Now, we're not going to discuss this today in, in, in great detail. We're going to this right part of this plot where the storm track transients supply the synoptically changing winds, uh, which translates over long-term averages in the probability density function of the surface winds, they together with the sea surface temperature front, they give us an aggregated response of the boundary layer response that gave us a surface wind diversion. So that's what we're trying to do today. Okay, so we are part of this boundary layer response to the advection and uh, possibly rotation, as I'll show you. Uh, the mixing, uh, um, uh, overall background mixing, and of course, the pressure and vertical mixing effects, they're all in here in response to the daily changing winds and the sea surface temperature front of the Gulf Stream. So the way we do that is uh, uh, that we extend the classical approach of a local regression. Uh, so what I showed you before in the um, in the Gullah's return flow uh, was a scatter plot of the surface wind divergence versus the ocean measures on the ocean measure scale of the surface wind divergence related to the sea surface temperatures, again, filtered to the ocean measure scale, but co-located at the same location. We related, we looked at the scatter plot of the surface wind divergence versus the sea surface temperatures at the same location. And all I'm doing here, I'm relaxing this and say, okay, let's make this a little more general. Let me say the surface wind divergence is not just a function of the local sea surface temperatures, co-located sea surface temperatures, but it's a function of the sea surface temperatures everywhere, right? And so it comes out from this, this convolution that the surface wind divergence depend on the sea surface temperatures everywhere. Uh, and this regression coefficient that you get is this A, this is an impulse response function. 
uh, uh, and that regression coefficient is anisotropic. It's not just a single number, but it depends on the direction of the wind indicated by this EU, the unit value, unit, uh, uh, unit vector of the winds, and it depends on the speed of the large scale winds. So that's simply the rationale for that's very simple. Uh, if you look at the sea surface temperature uh, feature or look at the particular wind divergent features and the associated sea surface temperature field, then you would expect that the impact of the sea surface temperature uh, on uh, on the surface wind divergence depends whether the SST field is upwind or whether it's downwind or whether it's crosswind, right? And so it should certainly depend on the surface, on the direction of the surface wind and should also depend on the speed because simply things can travel further in uh, over the over the with the stronger stronger uh, uh, surface winds, right? So this is the approach we're taking, as simply a sort of if you want a lag regression analysis, uh, and so we apply that to the quick scat data uh, again, and the AMS RC surface temperatures. We use the daily values or three day averages for AMS RC surface temperatures in the Gulf Stream regions, as I see here, for uh, many years, seven years or six years of data. Uh, of a quick scat and AMSI. And again, everything's filtered to approximately scales less than a thousand kilometers. So again, this is just a regression exercise. Uh, do least square fit of this equation to this data. It's a little bit messy uh, because for every snapshot, every day, you have to rotate things in the direction of the background winds and stratify them uh, by the background wind speed. So, but ultimately it's just the lag regression where the regression coefficient depends on the lags, of course, x minus x prime, the location between the winter divergence and the seasonal temperature, and depends on the direction of the slag with respect to the wind direction and on uh, the magnitude of the uh, of the wind speeds. So if you do this, uh, then you get this A, this impulse response function, that's shown in this plot down here. So let's just walk you through there. So that depends on the large scale wind speeds. And we have four panels here for one meter per second, six meter per second, 11 meter per second, 16 meter per second background wind. So that's simply the impulse response function for these different values of the large scale winds associated with the storm track. Now, each of these panels has, a, a, has two axes. Uh, the X axis is the lag, the lag in direction of the large scale wind. So large scale winds go from uh, from right to uh, from left to right so the lag in the in the direction of large scale wind of the downwind lag in the, uh, the downwind lag is given by the x axis and the crosswind lag perpendicular to the direction of the large scale wind is the y axis All right so that's a coordinate system uh, uh, origin being indicated by this little dotted line here origin being here and the contours are now this a so this is this impulse response function uh, formally for the surface wind divergence. Uh, so formally, uh, that is the response of the surface wind divergence to delta function of sea surface temperature right at the origin. Just think of it as a Gaussian that is shrunk uh, and expanded in amplitude such that the impulse, uh, so the product of the amplitude of the sea surface temperatures with the area remains the same. So this is the response of, um, of the winds to delta function of sea surface temperature of one degree K over one square meter. Units are a little bit odd, 10 to the minus 15 uh, inverse seconds per Kelvin per area. So if you think of it, that's you think of it as an eddy that has, let's say, an area of 100 kilometers squared and a sea surface temperature of one degree K. 100 kilometers squared is an area of 10 to the 10 square meters. So you would multiply this by 10 to the 10. Then you're back to the units of surface wind direction that we counted already, 10 to the minus 5 inverse seconds. So this is the surface wind divergence that we get from this type of this uh, delta function right at the origin. Just see what we get here. Let's look at the 11 meters per second. So we get for the SST right at the origin, where my cursor is, we get upwind of this. You get uh, positive values of the surface wind divergence. Downwind of that, we get negative values of the surface wind divergence. That's again entirely consistent with this vertical mixing index that we had before, that when we go from ambient to warm, so this is uh, positive values of downwind SST gradient. We get positive values of the surface wind divergence when we go from warm to cold. We get negative values of the surface wind divergence. So we cover this very simply. We also see that this dipole is asymmetric. So it's the values there are two contour values. Contours, if you can see this on the upstream uh, positive pole, but they're actually hard to see, but they're actually three contours on the negative downwind SST 
fault. So there's something going on beyond this vertical mixing effect. And that extends into a long wake. Is that this, this positive values of the surface wind direction aren't just confined to the vicinity of the delta function, but they extend downstream. And the, the wake, the distance that this wake covers depends on the large scale wind speeds. If the wind speeds are very weak, we basically have no wake. If we crank up the large scale wind speeds, then this wake starts to develop and becomes longer and longer the faster we go with the background winds. And if you ask, okay, what distance is this? So this distance is this is in hundreds of kilometers here. So this wake extends hundreds of kilometers downstream. If you want to scale it uh, and say what what kind of time scale, what kind of effective distance might that be? So if you asked, okay, how far does an air parcel go in half an inertial period? Then you find that approximately scales the size of this wake. So we'd say, okay, this is a response of the atmospheric boundary layer to this perturbation SST as a function of background wind speeds that involves also rotation. So we have to take the rotation into account in the boundary layer. And you see that also in that uh, this, this wake is asymmetric. It's stronger, if you look in the downward direction, stronger on the left side, looking in the downward direction than on the right side. So that's expect again this sort of asymmetry uh, you might expect uh, uh, based on rotation, and you can look in this dynamics into uh, some detail. Uh, this is basically this response is basically consistent with a damp Doppler shifted near inertial Lie wave. So it's damped because it sort of doesn't extend all the way uh, to infinity, but it's limited to sort of half or maybe one inertial the distance traveled in one inertial period. Uh, and it's a Lie wave. You can see this if you think of the uh, the wind vectors, simply wind vectors that we have. I don't have a plot for this uh, right now. If you simp or simply think of the wind vectors, what they do is if a wind vector comes along happily, air parcel comes along and now encounters this bump of sea surface temperature at the origin, then it would start, start an inertial. Based on this perturbation, you would expect maybe inertial oscillation. That would be an anticyclonic anti turning of the winds in the downwind direction anticyclonic, so that would be clockwise turning of the winds in the downward direction. Now, if we think of the pressure effect, then we say, okay, if we have a sea surface temperature perturbation here, we expect some kind of warm wake of warm air to the lee of that uh, sea surface temperature perturbation. So there should be some kind of warm low to, uh, to the lee of this, and this warm low, just based on Ekman dynamics, you would expect, okay, there at least should be an acceleration due to the hydrostatic pressure gradients that associate with this that accelerate the winds towards this low. So it give us these values of the surface surface wind convergence, negative values of divergence to the D here would account for this longer, longer wake, would account for this asymmetry. We say the dipole is the vertical mixing and this monopole is the pressure effect. We expect for this asymmetry that they're both vertical mixing and pressure effect works, but the pressure effect works at a longer scale, at a larger scale. And so that would count this, now coming back to the inertial effect. So we have a uh, warm low, we hypothesize a warm low here. So the acceleration of the, uh, of the uh, due to the hydrostatic pressure gradient would be uh, towards, uh, would be sort of turning towards, uh, so negative going from up down here in this plot, the vectors would be going into the low. And as the air travels along uh, uh, over this feature, the acceleration to the pressure pressure effect would also turn up here on this side would also turn anticyclonically, right? So here it's into the towards the war, towards the uh, warm temperatures. Here it's going a little bit backwards and would turn in an anticyclonic fashion in direction of the inertial turning. So we get some kind of resonance up here, accounting for the larger values on the left side of the wake as compared to the right side of the wake where the anticyclonic turning is opposite to the turning of the acceleration to the pressure gradient effect and gives you a diminished response. All right, so again, so this is damped, Doppler shifted near inertial Lie wave and then interacts with modulation of the vertical mixing, the dipole and the hydrostatic pressure, the wake uh, uh, that's induced by the warm the sea surface temperature perturbation at the origin. Okay, so that's uh, that's sort of the idea behind this, the physics behind this and we can also test this. So uh, uh, both you and I many years ago uh, uh, made a very simple extension of the Ekman, Ekman layer by simply saying, okay, let's look at an Ekman layer and simply allow one additional effect, meaning a large scale winds that pushes things around, right? It's simply linearization of classical Ekman dynamics 
um, uh, to this uh, uh, to a, in the presence of a large scale wind. Uh, now that's an analytic model. You can write it down, uh, uh, and uh, you can say, okay, what's the response of this analytic model, which basically gives us an impulse response function to some artificial sea surface temperature perturbation? Let's make it Gaussian. Gaussian sea surface temperature uh, perturbation with a one degree K amplitude and and a radius of seventy five kilometers. That's given here by this dashed line. So let's do this and do this for particular background winds of 11 meters per second that blows from left to right, right? And so we can evaluate uh, this convolution either from the model uh, that we have with Bo or from the A, the impulse response function that we just have observed in the Gulf Stream. So if we evaluate this for the observations, use this A, the impulse response function from the observation that I just showed you in the previous plot, then you get this feature. It's very similar to the impulse response function itself, because again, the Gaussian is not unlike a delta function, it's just a delta function, the shrunk Gaussian, just invokes now some of the smaller scales that are no longer excited. But you see this very nice asymmetry, this dipole that we just had, we see the wake, uh, and that's stronger on the left side. Now, if you do that from the theory, uh, it shows a lot of the same thing. Of course, there are big differences, but we again see from the theory, see the dipole, with a stronger pole on the lee side, and we see this wake that's stronger somewhat on the left side, that this has a different structure on the left side than the right side. This is a bit stronger in this theory, and that has to do with parameters that you have to use. There are about six, a handful of parameters in this model, and they're not, they're sort of just adjusted by, by looking at it and saying, oh, that looks good, rather than a formal process uh, of uh, looking for the optimal values. But I think this is very encouraging. Now, this is a completely linear theory. Again, it's a linearization of the Ekman layer. Uh, um, around the background wind. And so we can say this theory involves the modulation of the vertical mixing and the pressure effect, and we can look at them separately. And so if we only look at the vertical mixing effect and you see this dipole, and if you only look at that uh, pressure effect, you see this, this long wake with this low uh, uh, negative values of the surface wind divergence to the Lee uh, uh, sur surrounded by this, these positive values on, on both sides. All right, so that's a sort of the, the dynamics that we have here. Now, uh, I started out with the scale dependence, and you see when we, we try to explain this feature uh, uh, based on these two, two processes, we, it's actually very, very, it's a very comp complicated argument because we are in physical space and trying to explain something that's intrinsically scale dependent. Right? So you have to say, oh, this is small scale vertical mixing, and then the wake is a large scale. So if it's really scale dependent, then if we go to scales remaining to Fourier space, then we should get a much uh, much cleaner picture than indeed we do. So we simply take the, the uh, Fourier transform of the impulse response function. We take the Fourier transform of this guy uh, uh, in, in, in physical in, from physical space to wave number space. Uh, and then this A transfers into something called a transfer function. Right? So we take our uh, impulse um, sorry, we take our impulse response function and uh, uh, do a Fourier expansion of our impulse response function uh, into this A tilt, which is now a function of wave number and the direction of the wave number in the large scale winds and the speed. Uh, and this A tilt, that's called the transfer function. All right, and now that's shown here the transfer function that's shown in this plot here. And again, now the axes are the downwind wave number in the x axis versus the crosswind wave number in the y axis. We again have panels for the background wind speeds of one meter per second, six meters per second in this second column, 11 meters per second in the third column, and 16 meters per second in the fourth column. And then the contours is now the, uh, the Fourier transform of the impulse response function or the transfer function of the surface wind divergence. And what's quite amazing, again, this is from data, this is from a uh, quick scale data. Uh, it's quite amazing of how, how simple uh, and, and, and consistent the structure is. So you see this large values of blue here in the center part with some indications of these, these hotter colors, positive colors on the rounding. And this rounding, as we crank up the wind speeds, this blue area sort of compresses, becomes smaller and smaller in the downwind direction uh, versus this yellow areas expand in area. Uh, we have, I forgot to say, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a transfer function in Fourier space. We also have two columns. We have a real part so the in-phase response of the surface wind directions with SST co-located, and an imaginary part that's 90 degree phase shifted, a quarter wavelength, wavelength phase shifted response. 
in there. So both of these have very simple structures that we have this in-phase and uh, phase-shifted response for the larger wave, uh, uh, wave numbers and uh, sort of a, a reduction of, uh, of, of, the, um, of the lagged response for the very small wave numbers. And so large scale, small scale wave numbers, of course, this is not just a function of scale, but it should also, also be a function of the speed of the large scale winds. And that non-dimensional number that you form with this, form with this is something like the Rossby number, if you want. Uh, so that compares the advective time scale to, in this case, the inertial time scale, two pi over f, the inertial time scale. This is the inverse of the advective time scale, u dot k of u. So in the direction the 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 time it takes, or uh, yeah, comparing, comparing, I'm sorry, the, the yeah, the advective time scale versus the inertial time scale. And so the wave number that corresponds to a Rossby number of one, where the advective time scale equals the inertial time scale, that's indicated by this dashed line here, right? And all of this. And of course, if the background winds are very weak, uh, then the scale is very large. It's actually outside of this wave numbers that we see here. I'm sorry, the scale is, the, the scale is very large. Uh, so uh, the Rossby number equals one is outside of, of the scale here, uh, of, of wave number scales. But then as we crank it up to six meters, 11 meters, and 16 meters per second, we see uh, this Rossby number equals one, uh, sort of shrinking in wave numbers to covering at the end just uh, available wave numbers. But you see that the structure that we see uh, between the reds and blues, both in the in-phase and a 90 degree phase shifted response, the real part and imaginary part, that scales very nicely with uh, this uh, this Rossby number. So the dynamics sort themselves by scale. More specifically, they sort themselves by Rossby number. And that's I'm still amazed looking at this plot how clean that comes out from observations from quick scale data, uh, showing very nicely the scales. So we have the large scales uh, where we expect that vective time scale. Um, uh, 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 that's yeah, it, that's uh, for for the large wave numbers. We expect uh, that the air does not have time to adjust to uh, to the underlying sea surface temperatures. We expect something like the vertical mixing, a lag response, versus for uh, for the very uh, small scales where the Rossby number is close, uh, much smaller than one, where the air has plenty time to adjust to the sea surface temperatures. We will expect different set of dynamics. So I'll I'll show you one plot. Let's see, do I have a plot for this? I showed you before in terms of, of this year. So we see the vertical mixing effect acts on the smaller scales in the downward direction, pressure effect in the larger scales in the downward direction. So the separation between these two, we see that that separates in the, in the data by this Rossby number. Now there's one little twist here. You might say that's kind of weird because when I argue about adjustment time scale of the boundary layer, I might be arguing about a thermal adjustment time of the boundary layer. How fast does it adjust? How the fast does the temperature adjust? Whereas this F, this is a momentum adjustment time scale, right? And so I think this works because in this area, in the mid-latitudes, the adjustment time of the boundary layer, the thermal adjustment time of the boundary layer, is of the order of half a day to the day. It's of the same order as inertial time period, as inertial period, and that's why the scaling that we expect from um, uh, from uh, from a heat heat budget, a very simple heat budget, translates into the momentum budget and scales with the Rossby number. You can think about it differently. That maybe the response is largest when the two scales match. Right. So I pick out from the data. I pick out when. The thermal adjustment time and inertial time scales are of the same order. That's when they get the largest response, and that's what we pick out. Right? But in either case, so that means that it's an advective system. Uh, it's scale dependent based on this relationship of a time scale, in this case, inertial time scale, or maybe a boundary layer adjustment time scale uh, uh, with the advective time scale. And again, advective time scale is all based on daily data. Advective time scale uh, has to take into account the daily changing wind directions. Okay, let's see what we have here. What time is it? Oh my goodness, I'm burning through my time much faster. Okay, let's just go back to the Gulf Stream and I'm just going to whip through this. Uh, the main point is the scale dependence. So if you want, this is the main plot, main result that I would like to communicate today. Let's just look at coming back to the Gulf Stream to see whether that indeed works. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is again the feature that I showed you before. 
uh, the sea surface temperature front and the surface winter versions in, 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 in black. And so uh, we are hypothesizing it's this sort of thing. This, this convolution explains it. So where the surface winter version depend on the time average Gulf Stream sea surface temperatures and this observed impulse response function. And of course, we want the average of this. Now, if we say, let's just look at the dependence of the average sea surface temperature. So the Gulf Stream front doesn't change in time. It's always the same. And we have uh, a, a storm track over it that that uh, changes these, uh, uh, the direction of the large scale wind versus the SST front. So if we want the average surface wind diversion, we have to average that impulse response function. Right? And so in order to do that, uh, we have to take uh, this impulse response function and we average it, basically evaluate it for all directions of the winds and all speeds and then add up the response according to uh, the probability density function of the large-scale winds and direction. So if you take this, and for every occurring wind direction, we have to rotate in this wind direction, evaluate at the right speed, look at the responses, save the result, wait for the next speed, and then add up all these different bins. Now, what are the bins of the large-scale wind? That's the wind rolls of the large-scale wind. So that's shown here. The wind rows, uh, where the wind is coming from. So uh, you see in the direction, of course, that's the direction of the wind where it's coming from. Uh, the x-axis is the probability. How likely is that? And the color is the wind speed from 1 to 21 meter per second. All right, you see primarily your westerlies, of course. It, it, this, it mixes the storm track plus the seasonal cycle. It's all in its annual average, I mean, annual uh, probability density function. So for each of these spins of the winds, let's say this spin, we have to rotate this, uh, the impulse response function to that direction, uh, evaluate at that wind speed, and then add up all these responses according to the probability of each of these spins. Now, if you do this, then the average impulse response function is this dipole. It's all smeared out. It's an east-west dipole with a little bit of a stronger response in the average downwind response, downwind direction, so that's all expected. Now we convolve this with the north-south temperature front, and of course this dipole disappears. We basically really emphasize the, uh, uh, the, the, asymmet the asymmetry between these two. So if we do this, then that's what we get in terms of our reconstruction. So we capture very nicely uh, this dipole, approximately the same order of magnitude, can push a little bit further and say what's the difference between the reconstructed the dashed line and observe the solid line that's always negative and that's at least qualitatively consistent with the skewness or the bias that's introduced by the by the atmospheric cyclones and funds themselves uh, and so i think this is actually pretty satisfying now the value of this fint of course depends a lot on this how you do your regression if you do this the regression that we do to get the impulse response function is a bit complicated you have to do, uh, um, um, uh, um, you have to sort of discourage, this is a lot of a lot of unknowns that we have in there, so you have to discourage crazy values of this. So if you regularize, to introduce the regularization and the regularization value that you use, you can control the amplitude of that. But overall, it's a very robust feature that we get this dipole uh, of the surface wind directions of approximately the same order of magnitude. Uh, okay, let's, let's or just to say we can do the same thing now for the conditional averages and you see the blue lines the dashed lines are reconstruction yellow lines blue lines reconstruction for uh, positive values of the dominant as it's gradient yellow lines for the negative values and again we get the separation not not really exactly uh, but we qualitatively we get also this uh, the surface wind divergence conditionally averages by the wind direction relative to the fronts and that's already all i have to say so we would say that the Gulf Stream convergence zone is uh, part of an aggregated response uh, of the atmospheric boundary layer to the SST front of the Gulf Stream and uh, to the PDF of the large scale winds that are associated with the with SST. Again, it's an aggregated response. And you have to aggregate the split response of the boundary layer to the daily varying winds. And that daily varying winds is uh, sort of sorts themselves, the physics sort themselves by the Rossby number. Again, it might be luck or might be some kind of uh, matching of scales that it scales with the inertial period. Uh, but for Rossby numbers much less than one, we get something that is dominated by sort of an advective pressure effect. So the downwind pressure effect. Rossby number larger than one, we get advection vertical mixing. And of course, the largest response that it emphasizes in terms of, of our response, we have where the two match, where the Rossby number is of the order of one and both of the processes 
are active at the same time. And that's all, all I have for this morning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Nicholas. This was wonderful. Um, questions? So, and maybe while people are thinking of questions, I'll ask um, sort of the basic um, observing system question. You've got great results from available data, but if you were setting um, priorities for resolution in terms of time and space and vertical structure, what would you, what's missing? What do you think is necessary? So there are a number of things here. The first thing I saw, I, we look, I'm using QuickScout that does a winds, wind stress, equivalent neutral winds, and SST. And in the whole argument, I invoke air temperature. It would be mm -hmm. really nice to actually have these sort of pictures from air temperature and by the same token humidity. That would be really nice. So an observing system that can be as I like Oasis mm -hmm. to, that gives us the the uh, the surface heat flux associated with that. That would really close a, a important gap and would also then determine observationally this time scale for the thermal adjustment time scale of the boundary layer. So the equivalent to mm -hmm. F would be some kind of alpha inverse time scale uh, in the time scale of the adjustment uh, of the boundary layer adjustment time. That's a key to this whole argument. So that's the that's the first thing. So it would be spatial coverage, basically doing exactly the same analysis that we have here with a spatially varying uh, field of surface heat fluxes would be great. Uh, in principle, mm -hmm. there are of course high resolution products available for that. But again, we all know. I mean, that's why Oasis uh, exists. The quality of them are not all that great. It would be nice to have a, a high uh, a high quality data set of SE fluxes. In time. Uh, the whole analysis assumes um, uh, a, a sort of a quasi-steady response of the surface wind direction, of surface winds to the surface temperatures. So that that lends itself for time scales longer than the adjustment time of the boundary layer. So it would be longer than inertial period, longer than this adjustment time. It would be really cool to have that in higher time resolution, but that is a that's a tough order. Right? because now you have to be sub-inertial period. So you have to see the same observations many times a day in order to do that. So that that would be very, very nice. In the vertical structure, uh, so this uh, theory that I showed with Bo, we assume a constant boundary layer height. Of course, it would be very nice to observe the structure in the boundary layer height. That would be also very, very nice to have better resolution there. So right now we assume in the, in the theory, you can just basically the sensitivity of the vertical mixing uh, to the AC temperature difference. That's something you prescribe there, this sort of structure of the vertical eddy coefficient uh, to the AC temperature difference. And of course, that with that, you can simulate a change in boundary layer height. Right? You just give it some vertical structure. So it'd be nice to constrain that with observations. Um, so yeah, for the, that's the boundary layer response. I think these are the three things that would be very nice to have. I think we can do something with existing data, uh, with the buoy data that I haven't used here, where you have very high time resolution, you could think of similar analysis for the buoy data. You have to think about it a little bit. So you have one observations at the buoy with the surrounding fields from sea surface temperatures. You can do something with a higher time resolution, possibly, uh, but it's not the same as having that. That's like this pair of quick skirt and sea surface temperatures where you have spatial coverage of both the atmospheric boundary layer and the sea surface temperatures. Thanks. Um... Yeah, and I think um, butterfly, the butterfly concept it aims at getting some of what you're after, but exactly. not necessarily with the resolution that um, that you need. And that's probably a design question that should keep being discussed as that moves forward. There are questions in the right. chat, um, and maybe Megan wants to ask directly. Uh, okay, actually... Before, before I ask a question, um, that was a great uh, quote about, you know, what I really, what I really would like to have. Um, if you could have come up with a little pithy quote, uh, almost exactly of what you said, um, that's uh, Oasis is collecting quotes and, and oftentimes um, in the presentations, these quotes, uh, pop up and uh, and they can be really powerful. So um, just think about it. And th this goes for other people as well. You know, these really um, community needs, uh, but coming from a personal perspective. 
it's uh, it's very helpful. Uh, okay, so my question though was uh, whether you know you showed that slide that has the Rossby uh, that has the different um, slopes. I think it was Larry O'Neill's um, yes. figure. Yeah, and for all the different regions. Um, yes, you know, like, and, yes. and like in the Southern Ocean, it was really steep and less steep in yes. the Gulf Stream yes. and the Kiroshio and yeah. Um, now, can you explain these different slopes in terms of Rossby numbers? So that's, that's, a, that's the thing. So uh, the whole analysis depends on the geometry of the system, the, the structure of the SST front. It depends on the PDF, on the distribution of the large scale winds. Uh, that includes both the direction and the wind speeds. And an average, uh, um, an average uh, regression coefficient that's shown here involves all of these things. So if you just bear with me for a second. Now this is now you have to do a little bit algebra on your head. So if if you assume this is this is the underlying dynamic, right? Let's just go with this, and we say, okay, now we want to have a regression between the surface winds and the co-located sea surface temperatures, right? So that's what the coupling coefficient is, right? So then we would do uh, the regression of this with the sea surface temperature. So multiply this temperature at the same location, multiply this thing with the temperature at the same location, and then take the average over all of them. Right. So what we get them here, we get the lagged response of the sea surface temperatures, the, uh, the, the, the covariance structures of the sea surface temperatures uh, modulated or convolved with the average of the impulse response function. That's what gives you the coupling coefficient. So to get the coupling coefficient, you have to take all these three elements into account. The, this, the geometry, the, this, the, the PDF of the large scale winds and the boundary layer dynamics to get them. The the uh, this the structure the impulse response function or the the transfer function that I'm showing you here, that seems to be fairly robust from different areas. So Rizuko Masunaga has calculated these uh, for the Kuroshio, for the Golos, and uh, for the Gulf Stream, and they look sort of alike. Of course, this asymmetry that we see here, which is related to F, that flip sign, but overall this A doesn't seem to change all that much from one middle middle latitude region to another, right? Again. Mm -hmm roughly, but you still have the different distribution of winds. So this is one of the things that's on my list to do, is to do exactly what you're proposing, to look well, what's the relationship between these coupling coefficients and this impulse response function, do this algebra that we just talked about, basically the regression, the relationship of the coupling coefficients to the lag covariance structure of these surface temperatures and the average uh, averaged, uh, impulse response function to, to make that link. Great. But it's okay. but but it involves all of these things, right? You can't just just simply, you know, you have to do this exercise. You can't just say, oh, the average is, you know, synoptic variations average out. That's part of what I'm trying to say. The averaging of the synoptic variability of the storm track is something that has to be done with care. At the end, we might get something that looks like very simple dynamics, but we have to go through the steps of of seeing how that really translates through because it's. The synoptic variability is such an odd one effect in the boundary layer response to sea surface temperatures. Can I ask one more question? So, um, for these different wind speeds, is yes. that then um, a statement on the Rossby number? Well, the Rossby number exactly. I mean, that's that's how this comes about. If you look at again the wave number space, why does this change here? That U is the background winds, so that U okay. is the six meters per second here. Here it's eleven meters per second, so that's precisely what it is. Yeah, it's a large scale wind speed that gives you that modulates the response as you would expect. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we are just at the top of the hour, but there's one more question. So if people want to stick around for another minute or two, um, Shikar has asked uh, how you define x minus the x minus x prime vector and the unit vector in spherical so, coordinates or cartesian so it's a local cartesian coordinate system so I basically say i take a scene where i do my analysis that's sort of a box of a few thousand kilometers squared uh so and then i say okay so what's the overall average i do a scale separation saying okay my eu is a large scale wind so that's some measure for the average over this box 
uh, that gives you the direction of the winds and that everything that's not captured by this low low pass filter it's a high pass that's my that's my response and my x prime is now simply the lag but the lag rotate in the direction of the large scale wind direction right so you don't talk about east west lag or north south lag you talk about lags in the direction of the large scale winds and perpendicular to the large scale winds so for every scene you have to do that rotation so when you do the covariance structure calculate the covariance functions that are of course involved in this least square approach. All these covariance structures are in a coordinate system aligned with the large scale winds. They are no longer east, west, north, south uh, covariance structures. Right. So um, if there are any further questions, we're sort of out of time and we probably people need to get on with things, but um, we can, um, uh, so maybe people can stall and ask Nicholas, but I think we should probably stop now. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Nicholas, for a really wonderful talk. This was really stimulating. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. And thanks for getting up for us. Yeah, I know. Uh, the light's coming up. So, <laughs> <hey>. <laughs> all right. Okay.